Welcome everyone. My name is Carrie Keller and I'm the moderator of today's Global Diplomacy Dialogue on Digital Transformation that's being hosted by International Focus. I know that many of you in the audience are current members and supporters of International Focus, so welcome back to our conversation. For those of you who are new to the organization, let me introduce you. International Focus is a nonprofit that exists to promote mutual understanding between the people of North Carolina's Triangle Region and the international community. And they do this by facilitating face-to-face -face diplomacy and professional, personal, and artistic exchange. The team has created an outstanding panel for us today. I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, let, let me first share with you how our conversation is going to unfold over the next hour. I'll be speaking with our guests for about 40 minutes, and then I'll open the floor to the audience for 10 minutes of questions. So stay on the lookout for that. I'll be using the Q&A feature that's built into your Zoom toolbar. So during the panel discussion, make, make note of your questions and I'll let you know when you can submit them using that feature in Zoom. Okay, let me introduce you to our panel now. We have with us today, Phaedra Boinadiris, I think I got that correctly, and Victor Guzun. Phaedra is a fellow with the London-based Royal Society of Arts. She's focused on inclusion in technology since 1999. She's currently the business transformation leader for IBM's responsible AI consulting group and serves on the leadership team of IBM's Academy of Technology. Uh, Co-founder of WomenGamers.com, Phaedra is pursuing her PhD in AI and ethics at University College Dublin's Smart Lab. In 2019, she won the United Nations Woman of Influence in STEM and Inclusivity Award and was recognized by Women in Games International as one of the top 100 women in the games industry. Phaedra will be sharing with us today her deep knowledge of AI and ethics. Victor is a practitioner and educator in e-transformation implementation in Eastern European countries and former ambassador of Moldova to Estonia. He's also a proud alumni of the International Visitor Leadership Program, also known as IVLP. Uh, Victor will speak today about the role of e-transformation and e-governance from various perspectives and why these topics are indispensable for all of us uh, now and in the future. Victor, Phaedra, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Carrie. Thank you. Yes. So, so Victor Phaedra, we've discussed that our goal today is to have a conversation that demystifies these two topics that often feel rather mystifying to the average person, namely artificial intelligence and e-governance. Um, and over the next half hour, we're going to be taking the audience through where we are now on these two topics where we're moving to, and what gap we need to bridge to be prepared for the future of both artificial intelligence and e-governance. So Phaedra, with that, I'd, like, I'd love for you to kick us off with what is artificial intelligence and how are we currently using it in society? Well, firstly, Carrie, let me thank you and thank International Focus for inviting me here today to talk about my most favorite of subjects. It's, it's always exciting and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Also know that what we're going to be describing to you here today is really meant to disrupt your thinking and rare, raise the awareness that you have to really galvanize you to to want to be able to, to care about this every bit as much as Victor and I do. Uh, it's not meant to terrify you because we will be talking about some rather scary things, but know that everything we're gonna be describing is completely fixable. So starting with what artificial intelligence is, what artificial intelligence is, is it, it uses computers and machines to mimic the problem solving and decision-making capabilities of the human mind in essence. 
I think that the, the challenge that we have with artificial intelligence today is that uh, it is not magic. It is not this, you know, godlike box that has somehow been delivered magically to us humans. Uh, it's actually a, we fallible humans who are training AI, who are curating the data in order to help inform these models. Mm. Today, artificial intelligence is being used to make all kinds of decisions that directly affect us. You know, whether you get into that university that you applied for, whether you get that job, whether you get a promotion within that job, but within the, the job you're working for, what percentage interest rate you get on the loan, it goes on and on and on. And what keeps me up at night is that oftentimes either a person will not know that it's an AI that's making these kinds of decisions about them, or even if they do know, they make the very erroneous assumption of thinking that because it's an AI and not a human, that somehow, oh, the decision that is being made by this AI must be morally or ethically squeaky clean. And it, it, again, it, it could not be farther from the truth. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there are a number of uh, examples and use cases that we've seen within the press of um, both organizations that, you know, that have malintent that have misused data and AI. I mean, we've seen this, uh, you know, big example starting in 2018. But then what we've seen is that the vast majority of organizations that are getting bad press, that are eroding their brand associated with AI, may have the very best of intentions. But again, due to things like, for example, um, bias within their data set, or uh, not having uh, algorithms that are truly explainable, these kinds of things end up either causing individual or societal harm. Excellent, thank you, Pedro. Let me pause you there on that. I'm gonna circle back to a couple of points you've made just now, but I'd love to bring Victor in and ask Victor the same. Victor, when we talk about e-transformation and e-governance, what exactly do we mean? And, and help us connect e-governance with AI. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kari, and thank you very much, International Focus, for bringing me here. I'm back to North Carolina after the 11 years, and I'm so happy. But actually, you could see right now that we are using, in a way, artificial intelligence to connect each other. We are in uh, seven different di discrepancies, and you are in two, but we are somehow together. So we are already here. We are just don't realizing how much we are using this in a simple uh, uh, life. But actually I'm speaking now from a, let's say a digital nation from Estonia. And for me, everything that means e-transformation and e-governance, actually it's, it's, it's not, any, we are not speaking anymore about the life, we're speaking about e-life. Because we have all of us with phones, with applications, all of us, we're using some services. And now the basic question is how ICT tools and artificial intelligence could help us to become better for everyone. It's a win-win, it's for the government, for the people. So we are already here and this is for a long time. And actually this pandemic helped a lot to understand that actually one of the very few things which work quite properly, it's everything which is based on AI and computers and ICT tools. They are just uh, helping us to be better. So now it's absolutely clear that it's not a nice to have feature to have like e-transformation, e-governance, it's a should have. And this is unavoidable. So this is no way back to this. This is really important. This is not anymore an option of the people or of government of the cities of the states and the, and the globally, I could say. It's an obligation already because this helps us a lot about this. And it's really important to mention that this COVID pandemic, it's helped a lot to which you have to understand that actually, actually this is the truth. Just think about the stuff that, you know, one third of all the jobs in this world, more or less, they are uh, geographically neutral. So we could do everything or a lot of stuff from distance. But actually I will speak a little bit about Estonia where I'm here, where 99% of the services are online. Actually you don't know, but we cannot do online only two things. In Estonia, we cannot marry and we cannot divorce, but I'm not planning to do it. 
and I'm, I'm not joking actually, because uh, I made my passport and my family passport right in this, uh, uh, during the pandemic, right in this uh, uh, room to all my uh, families. And actually it took me 30 minutes, but uh, 20 minutes it took only to my, uh, my kid to stay properly on the photo. So I made the photo for my passport. I could do everything online. And it's absolutely clear that those countries who had implemented this, actually they, they uh, overcome this pandemic much, much better. And, and just may, maybe some other, just small figures. For example, just think about that 46.7 percentage of the people in the US will have the possibility to vote online during two minutes. And this vote, to cast one vote online costs nine times less, two minutes, everywhere in the world where it's internet connection. Just think about mm -hmm. this. Or just think about the stuff that using just the digital signature here in Estonia, it's saving us at least two percentage of the GDP. I made a, a, a calculation of the US and this is 40, 428 billion US dollars. And this is just the money. We're not speaking anymore about the paper. We're speaking about the changing of the mentality. So we are here, this is unavoidable and every one of us we are already here and this is helping us to become better and it's a win-win for everyone for businesses for people for countries for the government victor let me ask you this phaedra mentioned what's keeping her up at night i'd love to hear your answer to that as relates to e-transformation could you could you just mention exactly what what you mean once again yeah, sorry. so so Given, given the present um, state of where we are with e-governance, you have, you have mentioned to us previously as we were preparing for this conversation that, and I've personally experienced this myself having traveled, been traveling recently, we're at a very different levels of readiness across the world as, as relates to both AI and e-transformation. And I'm wondering what concerns you right now about where we are currently, globally, on this topic? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, uh, Kari, for this. We are in a very different position. And this is not compulsory depending where this country or this society is. I could give you tens of examples of the very rich countries which actually are not implementing this because of different stuff. It could be culture, it could be tradition, it could be laziness, it could be let's do it tomorrow. But actually, tomorrow already came this year. And actually, all of us are unprepared for this. We're speaking about online education. And this is so important to speak. Mm -hmm. But actually, don't know. But in Estonia here, online education is happening already for 20 years. But it's not meaning that actually will take 20 years for Spain or for, I don't know, Israel or other countries. Because the speed of the technologies, the costs of the, of the, of the technical elements, it's everything is changing and it's not changing in the matter of decades, years or months. We are changing everything in the matter of days sometimes. So some mm -hmm. of the solutions which were implemented right now, actually some of them, they were made even here in Estonia in, in the matter of days. So if the people would like to do, if it's enough leadership, enough ownership and enough understanding. And I think this, I will touch upon one very important uh, question about human roles. I always say, that e-transformation and e-governance is 90 percentage human factor and just 10 percentage uh, technology. We are not speaking anymore about technology. Technology is everywhere. I spent mm -hmm. uh, one week in Jordanian uh, desert and actually all the people who are living just in the middle of the desert, all of them, they have better and newer phones than myself. But actually mm -hmm. they made photos with them. But I could make with my uh, outdated uh, iPhone actually everything online exactly here. I could do mm -hmm. everything online. So this is important. And another one, which is really important, which clearly understand that now everything that means digital and e transformed, this is not anymore the question of rocket science. Yes, this is the question of how well prepared are you today and in the future. And very briefly, there are, in my opinion, there are four elements of uh, digital transformation. In 90s, we used them for some internal stuff. In the uh, 2000s, we used, somehow we tried to connect them between some institutions. 2010, we were started to think how we could make a little bit things easier for everyone. And right now in 20s here in Estonia, for example, actually all solutions which we are developing in Estonia here, they are based on NI. 
because for example this could save life my life because actually the ai system knows much better than a doctor and much quicker which kind of pills i should have or i should not have of course the final word is for doctor but if the emergency is coming and they know everything about myself and the time is critical in this particular moment they could save even my life this is so important so victor i i hear you saying that that what concerns you is there is a level of unpreparedness as relates to e-transformation around the world. And Phaedra, I hear you saying the same about AI in terms of uh, present state where we are with this. And I'd love to talk about um, now, move, where are we moving to? Uh, on both of these topics. So our audience has a sense of, okay, if we if we currently are assessing that we're un, unprepared on these two fronts, where are we moving to um, so that we can start to assess that gap um, and talk about that a little bit more? Phaedra, where, where are we moving um, from, from what you're seeing now in your practice uh, in the field of AI? What can we expect in the near term and and longer. So Victor referenced both a digital as well as an economic divide uh, you know, from different parts of the world. Um, what the challenge is associated with uh, artificial intelligence is it is a socio-technological challenge. As, as Victor said, it's not just, it's not the tech as much as it is the socio part, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about whether indeed you can trust a decision that's being made by an artificial intelligence, there's actually five things you must ask, right? One, you must ask, is it fair? Is it fair towards me, right? Is it fair towards others? The second is, is it easy to understand? Right? Is, it, are, is it able to detail what data lineage and provenance was used in order to curate that model? Number three is, is it robust enough to ensure that it's tamper proof so that somebody couldn't trick it into making a decision that benefits one group over another? The fourth is, is it accountable? Is it transparent? And the, the fifth is, does it preserve data privacy? of people. So I mentioned this is a socio-technological challenge, right? So think about these five different things I just referenced to you. And when thinking about the socio-technological challenge piece, know that organizations have to adopt a holistic approach to tackle this. One is culture. Two is tooling and AI engineering practices. And the third is governance. Now I'll start with culture and what that actually means. Culture is thinking very much about the people within the organization that's actually either designing, developing or procuring that AI model, right? You've got to ask yourself the questions of, you know, how many women, how many minorities are on that data science team? Diversity and inclusivity are absolutely critical because again, if you have one specific kind of person curating these data sets, they're gonna have their own bias, which is going to affect the data that they choose, the data that they curate. And there's countless examples that we have seen of this actually coming to pass. So you know how you've heard about the mathematical theorem, wisdom of crowds, like this is it reinforce, double down on your investments with respect to diversity and inclusivity. Also thinking about culture, right? Incorporate things like design thinking, in particular tech ethics in design thinking. Well, where well before you write any code, well before you're thinking through what's the business impact for this AI model that I have in mind, What's the primary intent, the secondary, and the tertiary potential unintended effects or consequences? So that then you can determine, given these tertiary unintended consequences, which ones could be beneficial, which ones could be harmful? And then thinking with those harmful ones, how do you design in order to mitigate that harm? 
And I, I'm telling you, Carrie, this is something, that kind of thinking is something that should be mandatory. In fact, we should be teaching our next generation how to think in this way. Why are we teaching this to high school students? Why are we teaching this to middle school students? Even components of this, I know my, my 10 year old would be able to tackle just thinking through. And again, it takes empathy in order to pull this off well, right? So that's, that's my spiel on culture and people. Mm -hmm. The second piece about tooling and AI engineering processes, right, is there's, a, there's sets of tools that you will find, many of which have been donated to the open source community that in essence will, will help you with those five domains, right? Whether it will synthesize data for you and to test your algorithm so you can protect people's privacy or whether it will mine for bias in your data set and give you a score and teach you how to mitigate for harm. Mm -hmm. This tooling is, is, is excellent, but again, it can't just be tooling alone that solves this problem. I mentioned the holistic approach, right? Mm -hmm. Then the, the last piece is governance. Governance is, what are you going to tell, not just the market or the world with respect to what standards you are going to stick to as an organization, but also what are you going to tell your employees with respect to what you promise? Is that AI model going to be fair? Is the AI model going to be explainable, et cetera, et cetera? This is something that you publish and you tell the world and you stick to and you audit and you assess constantly. Mm -hmm. This is how to do it. This is how to do it holistic approach and where this is moving to is I firmly believe in this idea of a good housekeeping seal of approval, right? So you don't need to be a data scientist in order to go into like, you know, a fact sheet and let me find out what's the score for fairness from this AI model that is being used by my bank to determine what percentage interest rate I'm going to get. Like, I, I want this to be so easy that my neighbor down the street, my aunt, et cetera, would be able to go and see the stamp. Maybe it's IEEE, maybe it's World Economic Forum, whatever the case might be that says, this is the international global standard for fairness, explainability, et cetera, that these AI models need to pass if it's being used to make decisions about people. Mm. I'm curious, Victor, does, is what Phaedra is describing from this holistic approach is that something that you're seeing in Estonia and has that, you know, this focus on culture and tooling and governance, is, is that some of what has created the success um, behind the e-transformation that is happening in yes, your part of the world? Yes, absolutely. And not only Estonia, because I'm not speaking from this perspective, Estonia. I'm speaking actually from a simpler perspective from a person uh, who 10 years ago, 11 years ago, never used one single uh, digital transformation or e-governance solution. And now I'm using only them. And actually that's why I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, yelling this every single day to Moldovan government and Romanian and a lot of state, you know, they cannot fire me anymore from my embassy or I don't know. And, and I, I could speak freely on this. Listen guys, we are living in 21st century. Yes, but we are using lots of technologies from actually 19th century, even some medieval. I'm not speaking about e voting here, but just allow me just to, to speak very slowly about some issues. So number one, it's we should be absolutely clear that the future of government everywhere, it's proactive, it should be online and it will be online and it's already online in most of cases. It's this 24 seven, which is working and it's intuitive, which is really important. And it's very easy to, to, to use. This is so important. This is number one. Another issue is that we are fearing a lot of stuff. We think that this is something distant, which is not touching us, which is not true at all. I could give you just one example. We're not trusting somehow the, I don't know, uh, healthcare system, which is online, yes? But I will disappoint you. Because, for example, if any doctor or the president of Estonia or the prosecutor general of Estonia will check my medical data or any of my data, I will see it here immediately. Are you absolutely sure that right now one doctor or one politician or one policeman or prosecutor is not checking your data? I'm not very sure about that. So we are believing a lot of stuff already for decades. For example, banks knows about us a lot of stuff. You don't know even how much they know. Facebook knows a lot, Amazon knows, and Microsoft and Google knows a lot of stuff. And 
be uh, you know, so they never promised you that they will not disclose the data they will not use they will never promise you so how it's in estonia in estonia is different i could check my data i'm the owner of the data i'm giving uh, 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 right to someone to check my data and if I see that someone else who is not entitled to do this, so I this is a, a punishment, it's a crime in Estonia. If you do this, if I see that one policeman or one prosecutor or president of Estonia check my data, I would ask the, the court for this, for the court case. So this is so important to mention about this. So, but, but just to come a little bit back where we are moving forward is not only the question of knowledge, it's the question of understanding that actually we are here and actually we're doing it already. And I really hope that, uh, uh, you know, now we will understand which kind of skills we're missing. And we understood how much time is needed to develop these skills. Uh, totally new professional skills and political leadership, which is really important, are now very much needed. Because we need like two elements. We need like a public pressure, if you want, from the public, but public cannot make pressure if they don't know how much advantages this is going and vice versa we need uh, from top down the leadership and example because i will give you just one example uh, 19 years ago chinese government made a, a, a gift to moldovan parliament a system to vote uh, electronically it's not works 13 years ago moldovan government paid parliament uh, uh, um, they uh, um, buy one uh, very expensive uh, devices, which cost like 2 million US dollars, and they never used 13 years ago. Last year, they buy the, the third generation, and they are still now voting with the raising the hands in Moldovan parliament. Is the question of leadership, understanding, and this is unavoidable. Once again, in Estonia, and this is actually not a, a, a how to say, this is not by case, that the Estonian kids are the best in Europe and everything was means STEM. Uh, Fedra knows this quite well. So the, we are number one in Europe already for five years in a row because the kids should be teached not how to you know, accumulate information. We don't need any more, a lot of information. My watch is more powerful than the, I said the, in a discussion than Apollo uh, was sent to the moon. And uh, in my phone, I could put more information than in the Library of Congress. Now we need uh, skills, how to use this huge amount of information in a, such a way that everything will be easier for everyone. So this is important and the role of education is crucial. The role of education and the role of creating this, uh, uh, including this kind of discussion, yes? To create a critical mass of people who understand what is this and which super benefits this is for everyone. For everyone, mm -hmm. once again. I, I, I... I, this, this moves us really nicely into talking about the gap between where we are now and where we're moving to and how what we need to do right now to get more ready for where we're moving to. And I hear you both talking education and political leadership. Um, I'd like to double click on education because I know, Phaedra, that's something that, that what both of you are passionate about. You, you have said this is something you're spending a great deal of time on. Can, can you tell us a little bit about um, state of play in terms of um, how currently young people are being educated or not in these areas and what we need to be focused on? Yes, I, I frequently get asked, look, I, I believe in what you're saying. You've inspired me to care, but I'm not in a position of power. I, I don't know how to affect change yeah. in this regard. And uh, the answer is first, you must demand um, trustworthy AI. You must demand transparency in your AI, that it is fair, that it is explainable, et cetera. But you can't do that unless you understand the fundamentals. And unfortunately today, when I look at who's even teaching classes about this topic, it is higher ed institutions who are teaching it to students who self categorize as future coders, future data scientists, future machine learning scientists. Think about that for a minute. Everything that we've just told you, right? 
uh, you should know about irrespective of what you want to be when you grow up, <laughs> irrespective of whether you're going to be a leader in agriculture, whether you're going to be a legislator, whether you're going to be affecting public policy or, or, or health policy. Like these are basic fundamental things that you must take the time to understand. And I would say also, oh, there's some feedback noise. There is, I can hear it too. Uh, Maybe if, oh, oh that's there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think higher ed institutions were doing a disservice by marketing this incorrectly. This is something, this kind of knowledge is something that we must be teaching at scale. Again, no matter, no matter what career path you have in mind. Uh, because again, even just the fundamentals beyond what we've been talking with respect to social justice and inequity, this is such a powerful tool, which is going to disrupt your industry regardless. So that's why you must understand the fundamentals. But I think, as I mentioned, this is something we should also be teaching to a younger and younger and younger population. Like just, mm -hmm. for example, those tech ethics by design workshops, mm -hmm. thinking through with empathy, you know, how do I design to make sure I'm not causing individual or societal harm, unintended individual or societal harm? Thinking in that way is absolutely, absolutely critical. There's no reason why we couldn't be introducing that kind of teaching early on now. And that's something that you in the audience can advocate for today. Today, go back to your alma mater, go back to your schools where you graduated from and start asking for this. Start asking Thank for you. just tech ethics classes or even like fundamentals of AI. Like we should be teaching this at scale. If you're someone sitting in the audience who now feels converted on, yes, you know, I'm, I'm starting to feel that I need to, I'm at my growing edge on this topic and I'd like to go further. How, if the education is not currently available, how would you recommend someone start to navigate on this topic? And, and um, what are the first small bites that you can take from an education point of view, resources? There's all kinds of resources that are being curated about this topic. For example, if you Google the organization called MindSpark, MindSpark, they have curated curriculum for K through 12 teachers. Right, teach the teachers how to incorporate this. And again, not mm -hmm. just computer science teachers, right? History, language arts, again, this is relevant. This is reg relevant across discipline. So MindSpark is one. Another organization to look up is P-TECH or Open P-TECH. There's a whole bunch of freely available online uh, curriculum specifically for students. That's for students to go and, and start to uh, disseminate some of this this information but more and more content is being pushed online in fact I had a conversation uh, last night with the head of uh, CS is elementary computer science is elementary it is a nonprofit that is uh, grow homegrown here in the state of North Carolina that is now being pushed out globally specifically dedicated to K through five grades Right, and we were talking about like, all right, let's brainstorm on how do we introduce this idea of bias being incorporated in mm -hmm. data sets at that young of an age. Like, we need to be doing this now, and we need to be doing this at scale. Take a look at some of the resources that I've described to you and introduce it to the schools that you come from in your regions, and let's let's plant this seed worldwide. Victor, um, picking up from, from planting the seed worldwide, um, talk to us what you're seeing on the political leadership front. You, you began to mention that a minute ago where you said that, that um, some legislatures still are not um, as ed educated as they should be on these topics. W what are you seeing um, in terms of this gap in understanding among our political yeah. leaders? We don't have to say that someone is guilty, that they don't know. And it is exactly the role of the educators to do it. Because if, for example, I tried to, to arrange a discussion about internet voting in Moldova, I asked, because, you know, because I was in politics and diplomacy, I know all of them and all parties and stuff like that. 
So I found only three members of parliament of Republic of Moldova who were ready to discuss about this. And I'm telling them, don't be afraid or shy to discuss about this. This is something new. This is something which uh, came last, uh, last decade, let's say like that. And this will be the future. This will not be, you cannot avoid this because you prefer to have the last iPhone, but somehow you are really sticking to these historical things. But let me just back, come back a little bit to this education, because for example, here in Estonia, we have like every year, we have different programs, how to bring this to the people. And just two examples, which will speak you a lot. So Estonia is the world leader. It's the most advanced digital society. This is crystal clear. But what you don't know, is that in the school, in vocational school, universities, even my university where I'm teaching, we do not have an ICT curricula at all. We just have the top priority that listen, these guys in kindergarten, in the school, in vocational school, university, post-university, they should be prepared for today's realities. And today's realities is that AI and ICT, it's everywhere. So it's everywhere. So we, and actually the educational institutions are not obliged, but actually they are selecting where this is necessary and which kind of tools and in which kind of sector they could develop. Something is in kindergarten, something else. And also Fedra said about education, but what you don't know, it's, we don't need any more so many teachers who are like uh, coming to the university and postgraduate and stuff like that. Now in Estonia, it's uh, a new school, it's coding school in Ich, it's called uh, a city. What you don't know is that there are no teachers there at all. So it's the leading ICT companies in Estonia. And this is so important what I want to mention. If you are not believing in this, that this is the future, just think about 10 years ago or even five years ago. Do you really believe that uh, things like Airbnb created that some stuff, some, uh, some guys will be, you know, the fear of all super rich uh, uh, hotel channels in the world? or uh, Uber will, uh, will, uh, will be much better than uh, maybe top 100 taxi uh, companies in the world, or Gazprom from Russia who promised uh, 10 years ago that they have one trillion uh, uh, on, on, the, on the market. Now they have 50 billions and Facebook has 800. So this is absolutely uh, uh, the, the reality which we are living right now. So just think about that by the end of maybe 10, 20 years, top 50 companies, actually, they will be more powerful than the government. And this is also another, another clash that uh, there are also two different cultures. Yes, so the states which are not, uh, you know, embracing these ICT tools and everything what's mean uh, uh, technologies. And as there are companies and the companies are sometimes more powerful than some governments of the world. And they're continuously, but they, they have another, another kind of culture there. Yes, so they're not very regulated. You know, Zuckerberg is invited sometimes to the Congress giving some, ad, but actually this is something totally different. So the role of cooperation between the state, ICT, CEO, uh, civil society organization and the society and explanation, this is critical. So the, the critical element is that we need leadership. We need education at every single moment of the life. And in Estonia, for example, 26 percentage, if I'm not mistaken, of the entire population last year came to some courses. What this could be, and I, a lot of them, they were on ICT and e-governance, meaning that education is not anymore what you are in this five uh, years or three years. This is the right. lifetime program for everyone. So just agree that this is the reality. And because things are moving so quickly and so fast, and the, the speed it. So just think about the last one. Think about what will happen with such countries which are in Estonian case right now, where it's absolutely okay to think about 60 percentage of the, and the, of, of the elements which are created based already on an eye. Because if a, a kid will be uh, born here in Estonia now, actually the system already knows about the kid is born Yes, it's, it's very simple actually. Yes, was born or not. And all parental benefits, uh, registration to your kindergarten, future registration to the school. This is a lot of stuff because the state also, the institutions could program what, what they have, what they need in the future. So it's a very powerful uh, element. So leadership, education, life learn uh, uh, program education, this will not stop. And think about the idea that we need this. In Estonia, we are lacking 12% 
12 percentage of the staff in ICT every single year. So we need to prepare more. And also think, of course, think about ethics. This is so important because yeah. of course you could rush and implement a lot of them. But if you're not taking care about the ethics and about the privacy and about the security of all this information. So it's, if it's a lot of actions, no strategies, that's a problem. If it's a strategy without, uh, uh, without action, it's another problem. So how to find balance between all actors of the society? This is so important. Yes, it, it, that's what's circling in my mind at the moment too is, is the, I, I think I hear you talking about the cross-sector collaboration as well when you're talking about uh, public, private, citizen sectors being able to um, come together, share knowledge, figure out how to build toward um, socially responsible use of AI and e-governance? Am I hearing both of you correctly on that front too? Yeah, if I may just to finish this idea. So this is so important from another perspective as well, because if the government, any government in the world, they think that they are so clever, they know everything, they are, you know, they are lacking the, the, the reality of today. So the knowledge, so the, the companies needs government because nevertheless, we need regulation, how to put this in our logical stuff and things like that. But any government in the world being the most powerful, the most richest, they will not have minds and, and, uh, and brains like Facebook, Google, and Amazon have. So the really important element is this cooperation. So this is, this is crucial from this perspective and from this understanding. And those of the countries which are not understanding this now, they will face it. This is unavoidable. But the, the big question, it will be where these particular countries will be. And once again, this is not you know, depending on how rich country is and stuff like that. And another element, the really last one. So every society, if it's enough will, enough leadership and enough understanding and education, they could do it much quicker than Estonia did or Denmark or Sweden or Finland or stuff like that. For example, Germany, you know, I was last time in Germany, they asked me to pay by cash, but everything which is in, which is in Estonia, it's actually less expensive. But in Germany, they asked me one percentage because I wanted to pay by cash. This is unthinkable in the uh, third millennium. What you've just said about political will makes me think of something that Phaedra mentioned in our conversation this week as we were preparing for this conversation that in the US, Phaedra, how many bills have been, pieces of legislation have been put in, considered uh, uh, among our congressional members but have not moved forward I on the topic of preparation for AI? I believe it's been over 80 and uh, I would add also, uh, to tack on what Victor said about political will, here in the United States, we used to have an office called the Office of Technology Assessment that was made up of nonpartisan technologists, in essence, doing a civic tour of duty, where they would be helping to inform our legislators in Congress about investments in technology. And, you know, here's what's coming, here's things to consider with respect to regulation. And what happened was when Ronald Reagan was president and there was a big discussion about Star Wars, the missile defense program, the Office of Technology Assessment technologist said, this is a really bad investment, do not invest in it. And uh, there were some Congress people who really didn't like that answer and cut their funding. And it never got resurrected. And, and I think that is a real shame. In fact, we need an Office of Technology Assessment now more than ever, not just technologists doing a civic tour of duty on a national level. I think we've got an opportunity for them to do that on a state level, on a county level, on a regional level, especially looking at what happened with this pandemic, right? You know, you've, we've had counties here in the state of North Carolina that, really suffered because they didn't have access to broadband for remote learning. So what are you going to do for all of these kids? And there was this last minute scramble with technology companies to figure out how to solve and mitigate that, that challenge. So, so yes, political will is, is absolutely crucial and it must be a partnership between both industry, government, and I would say academia, because we've got to make sure we're hitting education hard. 
Yeah. Let, let's let's bring our audience in now to this conversation. I see a number of questions coming in. So audience members, please feel free to use the uh, Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions. I see um, several have come in. Let me pose a couple that I see so far. Um, Victor, do you see one that you'd like to yes. respond to? Yes, okay. yes, yes, very quickly. Amadi, thank you very much for your two, first two questions. Number one, it's disconcerting about what the role of humans. The humans could have a lot of uh, issues to have and a lot of uh, elements to do in more in much more pleasant way yes but actually what's mean e-governance e-transformation and i it's actually helping us not to do sorry stupid repetitive some stuff to go every day to some offices to present some uh, documents and some elements actually those questions and those issues which could be solved with the AI, actually they should be solved by machines. That's absolutely clear. And actually we could use the remaining time, resources to stay with our uh, you know, dear ones, to do everything what we want, to develop ourselves and stuff like that. So this is so important to, 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 uh, to uh, mention. Next question is regarding the people in the remote areas. Yes, I agree with you that there are a lot of of places where they don't have some basic stuff and some basic elements, but look at the, at the realities. We have also another countries which actually have all kinds of uh, technologies, all kinds of machineries and not using them. So this is, this is actually changing because machines are becoming gradually cheaper. And actually this is not argument from my perspective. You know, Mongolia, for example, it's a 3 million country uh, in Asia and, uh, a lot of people think that they are you know, far away, me, living in the desert. But what you don't know is that, that last, last year, they implemented this crossroad uh, platform. It's called like X road, where all the elements are, are connected. And already 80% of people from Mongolia are connected somehow here during one and a five years. So this is very quickly and the machineries are becoming really, really cheap. So, but of course you are right. We need here a lot of more global understanding because wh what we have now, we have islands of, let's say, prosperity from this perspective, and we have big islands where nothing happens. So I think we need more discussion at the global level. At the UN level, we don't have a body who is dealing with this. At the EU level, finally, we have discussions uh, about the EIDAS and all this kind of regulation and stuff like that. So we have this. But now I think that we really should go... Uh, uh, global. Hacking Treats, uh, David is asking, what is the role of the, the government? This is crucial role, but it's really important to explain to the people what is this, to keep this. I, I'm not sure if you know where it's where the NATO Cyber Defense Center of Excellence is located. It's not in US, it's not in Vermont or in San Diego, where you have uh, huge bases. Actually, it's in Estonia. And where the biggest uh, 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 drills uh, in cyber defense are organized. It's also in Estonia because it's knowledge here. And where is the databases for, for the all EU citizens traveling? It's also in Estonia. Because if you are developing this, actually this is a win-win for everyone. What, what I want to say. And the change could be really, really, really uh, quick. I will stop here. I will give the possibility to Feder to speak also. Well, let's let's talk about. There's a question that's come in. I'm curious about Phaedra's thinking on this um, from Jess Porta. My question is: What challenges or opportunities did COVID present for e-governance uh, or AI? So I'll let you both weigh in from your respective um, expertise on that. I would say what what we've been seeing is that COVID really unleashed a tsunami with respect to uh, intelligent automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Uh, there have been more investments in this space due to, I think, because of the pandemic. So that's the opportunity. The challenge is, and Victor has alluded to this, skills, 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 right? Because how many jobs did those technologies displace? 
are the their people skilled enough in order to implement these kinds of technologies, be able to maintain them over time, and of course, you know, design them in a responsible way. I mean, the, this is again absolutely critical for us to consider as we're moving forward. In parallel, as I mentioned, even before we talk about e-governance and and artificial intelligence, what, what we saw in, here in this state was even simpler than that, internet access. You, you can't even <laughs> get to that level where you're talking about implementation of AI and how it's gonna affect people's lives if you don't even have basic access to the internet. The state of North Carolina, we were the first one within the United States to get wire pulled to every single public school and every single public library within the state, but we didn't take it to the last mile, meaning to, to people's mm -hmm. homes. And so you've got swaths of the state, again, typically from historically disadvantaged communities that just simply didn't have the internet access. So when COVID hit, when the school shut down, here were these kids in these households that just didn't have access to remote learning, pure and simple. And yes, the this, this state scrambled and they installed uh, Wi-Fi devices and routers to public school buses who literally drove out to these communities, parked at a bus stop, and the kids would schlep out with their borrowed or used Chromebooks in order to download and upload homework. We can do better. We must. Yeah. We must do better because again, what I've just described to you, if you look at it in the context of this tsunami of intelligent automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence, we've got to, we've got to be smarter about this, not just in terms of skill sets, but everything that I just described to you with respect to, to accessibility and of course our responsible use of this tech. Victor, yep. Yeah. Yes, if I may also, I see a question from David. What do you think the role of e-government should take in implementing hacking teams? But this was answered. It's another one about the COVID. So I think yes. this COVID pandemic, which is really, really important, it's, you know, we've always speak about the new normality, yes? Some people speak about new normality. Some people speak that soon we will come back to the previous normality. Both of them are in a way, uh, how to say, uh, questionable. And I'm telling you why. For example, I'm traveling a lot with my consulting company, but really now I could tell you that I will think twice or maybe 10 times before going to the next conference where to deliver a speech for 30 minutes. And really what I will see that the physical presence will give some additional value to this. I will go there. So this is actually the new normality. This is not coming back to, to, to the, the previous one. This is important to mention. And this is also, what, how, what the state should do. It's very simple, actually. They should decentralize. So the, the state should understand that this centralizing system is not anymore here. Because uh, uh, information, decision, AI, it's everywhere, it's circulating in the matter of uh, half of the second. This is an, uh, important. Make it simple. I always say, kiss, this is not the rock, ba rock band, yes? Keep it simple and short. Because actually we are overwhelming people with very complicated and number of information accumulating every single second, not every single hour even. So let's make things uh, simple. Enable smaller players to contribute to the public service infrastructure. This is important because no one knows what the, uh, you know, the ultimate uh, beneficiaries needs actually. We simplify everything, stop this uh, massive e-government rollout which cost probably millions or hundreds of millions in Eastern Europe. We, I know personally, lots of systems which actually spend lots of money, tens of millions of US dollars, and they are not used because actually they were not designed for the final beneficiary. Someone in the top level decided somehow that this will work. Will not work if you'll not educate people. And uh, also the, maybe the last uh, moment uh, here, it's build everything in a modular step-by-step -step, uh, fashion. So mm. because the things are changing all the time, if you're not taking all this in consideration and actually the COVID, if will, this opportunity will not give actually the knowledge and understanding to the societies and countries who will lose a lot and will be enough countries which will use this opportunity and will be also enough countries which will not use. 
this opportunity. And here is the big, big question mark and the big shift. And I'm quite sure that in 10 years from now, if we organize another discussion like this, actually what I'm saying right now will be absolutely the case then. And once again, this is not the question, this is Switzerland, uh, Guinea, uh, Morocco, or Jordan, or US. No, this is the question of understanding and it's not the question of money, geographical location, and stuff like that. So what I'm taking away from this conversation is that um, globally, um, in many places, we are a bit flat-footed, and a bit might be conservative. We're very flat-footed in both of these areas of e-transformation and AI. Um, Phaedra's word of tsunami really hits me in terms of what is coming, and that we have, in terms of our call to action at the you know, if you're, our audience members are probably sitting thinking, given what we've just heard, um, what's, what's our thinking on, on the, the prescription for, for moving forward? And I, I've heard education and political leadership and collaboration across our sectors. I'm curious in 60 seconds before we wrap, I'd like to hear closing thoughts from both of you in terms of just a practical, tip or takeaway that you'd like to leave with our audience based on what we've discussed. Phaedra, over to you. Uh, in closing, there's no turning back this clock. Uh, it's not like we can go backwards in time before we had these technologies and somehow you know, regulate it away. That, that is not gonna happen, that is not gonna work. In fact, if you think about some of the biggest challenges we wanna tackle as humans, you know, whether it's, we want to uh, come up with solutions for climate change. We want to travel to other planets. We want to, I mean, dot, 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 right? We're gonna need technologies like artificial intelligence in order to solve these problems. What we're simply proposing here via this talk is that we must host a smarter conversation about it. A smarter conversation that incorporates a, a more democratized approach towards AI something where we're truly responsible stewards of this technology that is addressing both the digital as well as economic divide. I think that is what is, is really crucial here as we do this. And, and again, this is such a powerful tool. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We just need to be smarter about how we're moving forward. Thank you, Pedro. And Victor? Yes, uh, I try to, to put some ideas because actually I love this topic uh, and I could uh, speak for days, but very simple. Once again, as Fedra said, this reality is here to stay. This will mm. not run and this will only develop. That's absolutely clear. Uh, another one, it's uh, ask for more e-governance services because they could be built literally everywhere and in every particular sector. Doesn't matter, this is agriculture, chemistry, physics, I don't know, travel, everything. Ask for more ego because this is not only fun. This is not only, how to say, fashionable. This is using, uh, actually giving you the possibility to use better your time and it's simplifying life to everyone. Number three, of course, this is so important. Maybe it's number one, start with yourself. So find something small, uh, this kiss uh, element don't 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 start with something which is so big that nobody understand but maybe uh, I, i'm calling this like a marathon with sprint yes marathon is 42 kilometers i'm also a runner but actually you are designing which kind of tactics to choose i'm saying always marathon because you have the goal it's long time yes but sometimes you need also sprints sprints are important yeah. from different perspectives because you start to believe that this works and also the last element which is critical is create partnership so partnership sharing is caring in this no one is clever enough have all the resources and all knowledge to do it make partnership and i'm so thankful to you and to international focus that you create this kind of discussion because this is exactly what i mean i would love to see a course uh, taught by the both of you <laughs> together i would be a happy pupil to be learning from both of you going forward. So I'm super appreciative um, of the investment that both of you have made today in, in our education on both of these topics. I, I can feel your passion and um, it's your time is valuable. We really appreciate 
appreciate it. Um, I'm super grateful to our audience as well for your time and attention and your questions. And as Victor said, to international focus for making uh, conversations like this that are really critical um, from a, a societal health, um, really important. So thank you to everyone. A, a couple of reminders before we close. Um, if you're not a member or a supporter of International Focus and you would like to be, to have more of these conversations and, and be a part of this community, which is wonderful, you can go to internationalfocus.org to, uh, to join us. And my last reminder is about upcoming programming. Um, we have on June 24th, the International Art Show of Raleigh that's happening online this year. Um, and so the, wherever you get your social media, you can find more details about this art show um, so that you can participate. Um, with that, I will close with uh, a, a big thank you to everyone and a uh, wish for a happy weekend as well. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Bye. Thanks, Deidre. Thank, thank you. Bye. Stay thank safe. You.